<laughs> okay, uh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Louis, you didn't disappoint. I, I'm sure there'll be uh, lots of questions. I have my own set, but I will initially uh, defer to uh, to others. Uh, go ahead, Abby, you can start us off. Lou, it's always it's fantastic to listen to you. Uh, personally, for a long time, I have not heard a talk which is so, in terms of architecture, it's so, in terms of scope, it's so sweeping, it's so giving the full thing. And actually, frankly, I always felt that since uh, Prague, this was, this was part of the absence. That kind of talk was, was hardly there. Elements here and there. So I, in that respect, I applaud you. Also, in terms of uh, another comment, I think that, and I'm slightly surprised, I think that you are more on the visionary side than on the realistic side. I mean, obviously, you need to appear as relevant, so, but, but it's nice to hear you're on the visionary side, because it's, it's quite full of vision. Uh, that many, many issues, but I'll, I'll choose two or three, just, 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 just to, to, to rest for, for discussion with any others. One is you need, I mean, this architecture that somebody needs to lead. So there is an issue of global leadership, and there is the issue of the United States, the, the new president, would assume that kind of leadership. I think one of the issues is that Barack Obama, for example, up to 2009, beautiful words, beautiful poetry, but you can say all sort of excuses, Iran and so forth, but there was never ever to go into the pros of what to do or to give leadership. He was busy in many other things that Prime was left. How do you reach that kind of leadership that would be accepted in the world? So that, that's one issue. You ignore totally South Asia and the Middle East completely from your talk. In, 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 in this time today. That's right. Day. That's right. So at least for in terms of concept, because the whole thing was conceptual. <coughs> in South Asia, we have today a situation that both sides believe that their security rests on nuclear weapons. There is that kind of. How are you going to persuade them to move out there? And actually, there is a place today, I mean, North Korea is indeed a danger, but there are two places, North Korea and South Asia. How do you? The Middle East and Israel. How do you persuade, at what stage you take them? Because obviously, opacity is unacceptable. You cannot have, within that kind of architecture, opacity. It's just not acceptable. Opacity today for Israel and Netanyahu is a way to keep pushing no Palestinian state, there's such an expansion, all that. So it's play a political role. How do you deal with that? You need an American presidency with a lot of toughness to deal with that kind of resistance. So. Well, the answer is we got that. Uh, sure, well, let's yeah. start in that fashion, then we'll collect some more questions in a moment. We'll go okay. ahead, Charlie. Um, at the back end of the paper, uh, there's a, uh, a, a paragraph uh, which basically argues that uh, the whole the whole argument of the paper uh, assumes that uh, the next president of the United States, either from the start or after the equivalent of uh, uh, President Reagan's agonizing reappraisal of arms control and, and so on, that the next president of the United States will remain uh, engaged in the world. So the first assumption is the possibility that the next president of the United States will not remain engaged in the world. So my argument, and, and then the paper basically argues, uh, I'd have to write a completely different paper if I didn't assume that the next president. So on second point, uh, on, on, on the importance of leadership, I agree with you completely. And, 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 it's, and it's, not in the, it's not in the paper, uh, but it's, 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 it's in the paper in the sense that the argument for American leadership is, is, is related to the fact that our own, our own strategic interests in, 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 in at least three areas that come to my mind uh, immediately, our own strategic interests are served by American leadership in putting out this type of a vision. Uh, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then pursuing it. Uh, our own strategic interests are served first in, in a tough-minded way in that uh, part and parcel of dealing with Putin's Russia that seems to think nuclear weapons so are usable is going to have something to do with uh, ensuring that you have revitalized deterrence 
conventional nuclear whole shebang, uh, and, and, and that you have uh, sustained the process, even if it's, it varies over time, of, of, of nuclear modernization. Uh, so, so, so in part, American leadership in setting out a new vision uh, is important because it's, it's an enabler for other things that you're going to want to do to deal with it. But the second reason I think American leadership uh, in setting out this vision is important is that um, it is true that every president since, since Harry Truman uh, has tried to uh, move the world in what, what, what was seen as a safer direction with regard to nuclear weapons. And, 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 and I think that uh, it is in our, our strategic and security interest and in our, in our larger interest to do this. So that's the second, that's my second sort of case for it. There will be American leadership uh, because there's a, it, it historically has happened and, 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 and it's important. The third is the narrower, the narrower strategic logic. Just as I would argue there's a strategic logic for the Chinese to engage us and for the Russians to, to engage uh, in this process, I think there's an American strategic logic. I don't think, I think we'll, you know, the, I think we'll be worse off if, uh, if we have to you know, pour a lot of resources uh, that we don't really have into growing strategic competition with. Chinese, uh, or, or, or with the Russians. Uh, so, so, that, so, but you're absolutely right. It presupposes leadership, and in several different ways, it argues why leadership uh, might occur. Uh, and without that leadership, I believe uh, uh, you're right that, 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 that it will not advance. Uh, on South Asia, uh, the paper does discuss South Asia, uh, and, and, and in South Asia, it strikes me that uh, is. Uh, Three dimensions uh, for South Asia. The first dimension is to acknowledge that if we're thinking about where a nuclear weapon might be used, you know, one of the possibilities is that in the next one of these, uh, you know, India-Pakistan uh, military confrontations, uh, the situation does get out of hand, and, and 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 there's a serious risk of use of the nuclear weapon. So part of my argument about the P5 engaging on reducing the risk is related to dealing with the the, the I was about to say immediate, it could be immediate, it could be next week. I mean, what the, the, the Indian government right now is trying to decide how it's going to respond to the Pakistani uh, uh, supported individuals who just attacked an Indian military camp you know, a few days ago. Uh, it could happen right away. Okay, so part of, it, part of South Asia. Beyond that, it strikes me in South Asia, working the South Asia problem uh, points you in two, in two, other, uh, in two other directions. Uh, three directions. Uh, the traditional emphasis on the part of the United States and uh, on, on, on restraint. You know, we've been arguing restraint in different ways with the Pakistanis and the Chinese for, and, and the, and the, and the uh, Indians for a long time. Uh, so we keep doing that. We keep urging them to you know, do more confidence building stuff. Uh, but, but it seems to me that there's another way to get at India and Pakistan. And, 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 that's, uh, and that's through the sort of uh, the, the billion carom shot of China. To the extent that the Indians uh, uh, are thinking about the possibility of, of moving uh, their missiles, uh, it's partially related to concerns about China. So if you could kind of establish a more process of reassurance between the United States and China, in which the Chinese restrain their own strategic modernization, the Chinese restrain <coughs> whether or how far they go into their own strategic places. It spills back into trying to induce restraint in, in India and Pakistan. Uh, in addition, uh, my, 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 my ambition for South Asia uh, is, is related to the sense that India and Pakistan uh, are not going to be prepared to restrain their uh, nuclear weapons programs uh, unless, on the one hand, there's restraint by one of the drivers, which has to do with uh, China, or on the other hand, they get into some sort of really nasty uh, Cuban Missile Crisis type uh, situation. And one of the arguments I make in the paper and that I make otherwise, for going, finding a way to move, to get this Fissile material treaty off the dime uh, is that I would like to have a fissile, matri fissile material treaty negotiated and out there so that at the point in time where the governments in India and Pakistan think they want to signal restraint to each other, 
they can pick up on this treaty. Uh, and sure, they want to negotiate it, but it'll be a little bit like the limited test ban treaty in the U.S. Russian Soviet relation. Okay. On the Middle East, on the. Try to. I'm about to finish. Okay. Uh, this is a great, I don't mean to fill the rest of the It's a long paper and a lot of stuff. So, but before the end of the it best fits the bill of my, 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 my uh, building block that I can't, the one in which unless you solve these political, the big political disputes, you never going to make progress. And so, the Middle East, I leave you down the road uh, if you deal with the other things. That's, that's not a good answer. But Bill told me to stop. <laughs> Let me uh, encourage. Okay. Well, okay. I want to encourage sure. some of our our students also to uh, yeah. weigh in here. So I think we'll collect a few questions. And uh, I, I see uh, Bill and Kyle and Chris. I took my watch off. And so Tiara. <laughs> and I have, to, I have to mention one person who's in the room here. The, we won't recognize, but the name will be familiar. Uh, Paul Warnke. Uh, whose uh, <laughs> grandfather uh, used to uh, interact on these issues also. Do this sort of thing, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, Paul. I just I couldn't resist with the glue. So if we can take uh, okay. that string of, of individuals, just one question each, if you uh, would, for the moment, and uh, then we'll let Lou respond. Sure. So Phil, you want to start us off? Cool. Yeah, for sure. So it seems to me there's a distinction between sort of, this is a kind of a macro level question, uh, so you can take it in a different direction. It seems to me there's a distinction between how nuclear weapons do, do or don't affect international politics, which is an empirical question, and we'll come on lots of different places on that, and the policies that we adopt in response to our perception of how they affect international politics. And so what I was thinking about during your talk is, is there a kind of implicit or explicit theory of how nuclear weapons do or don't matter that underlies your policy recommendations? And is your core policy recommendation that you think there's a disconnect between our current policies and your perception of how nuclear weapons do or don't matter? Or is your policy recommendation that we need to change the way that nuclear weapons matter in national politics? Obviously, those two categories blur, but hopefully that's a useful, maybe provocative way to frame a kind of really foundational issue here. Thank you, Bill. Kyle, I think I had you. Oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, my name's Kyle Pluti. I'm a student here. Um, my question was much more specific uh, in relation to your proposal for uh, kind of what to do now that New START is, is up for reevaluation. Uh, you proposed kind of this uh, massive reevaluation. Um, but do you think that given kind of the tensions uh, and the, the situation between the, US, between the U.S. and Russia right now, would that possibly open the door for it all to fall apart um, and make just having trying to do such a, a massive reevaluation would would lead to it not going anywhere as opposed to a much kind of already laid out idea of say just re-upping new start or or building off of that foundation do you think this is the correct time to do a reevaluation kyle chris uh, i just want to say uh, thank you for your time um for uh, and my question is related to um, your proposal in regards to U.S. I mean U.S. Russia and U.S. China um, negotiations. Or, um, um, what, how, how would you address the fear or uh, the concern that if U.S. says that uh, if you don't start negotiating with us, or you don't start cooperating with us, then the United States will uh, take you whatever you know of action um, necessary to choose security. Um, how would that be to like? I mean, well, I mean, um, that might lead to situations where Russia and, and China decide to actually push back strongly and actually form an alliance and we really, really face a real cold war. So, how would you address that concern? Thank you, Tiara. My question is about the um, Russian Soviet relations. Um, you you can speak up too, Tia. Okay. So assuming that some nuclear weapon states do not undergo this by 2045, what would you say is the consequence for non-nuclear weapon states that have positive security assurances with nuclear weapon states, and could that push them into proliferation? Thank you. Paul? Well, yes, my question was why you chose 2045, and why not shorten that kind of time horizon um, to, you know, appease the critics who will be quick to say that this is 
too far in the future, and that leaves a lot of chance. And it's kind of what your thinking was in choosing that date. Okay, that's a, a few. Can I, can you back off real Okay, sure, Liz. Real quick, um, so talking about existing building blocks um, and trying to, you know, promote U.S.-Russian Chinese cooperation, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on why the U.S. is um, so strongly opposing the Russian initiative to <coughs> ban um, placing nuclear weapons in space, being the first to do that. And I'm sure, I think that China is also very supportive of that initiative. So couldn't the U.S. you know show leadership in you know trying to cooperate with them on an issue that already exists to help bolster cooperation? Let me we have let me let me pause for just a second. Uh, I will call on our visiting fellow uh, in just a moment. But let. Uh, Dr. Dunn respond to the, I think, the six questions that we put on the table, and then we'll continue uh, another round here. I, I, I stand to be corrected. I won't be able to, uh, until I get back to my hotel room and can Google, and Google it. Um, I thought we already had a treaty ban putting nuclear weapons in space. So I guess, uh, so, so if the Russians have a new initiative to ban nuclear weapons in space, uh, I have to figure this out. You first place them. Well, wait a second. You've got an initiative which already, you have a treaty which bans the place of nuclear weapons in space. And so I don't know why you need another treaty. Uh, to well, shouldn't we engage with them more than just saying no? Not well, I think we want to engage the Russians on, on, on whatever cockamamie ideas they have and whatever good ideas they have. <laughs> I mean, I've always been a great engager. Uh, I, I think the argument would probably be it's totally unverifiable, but uh, but, but, but I, th I thought we had a treaty. Uh, so, uh, but yes, we should engage the Russians. Uh, that's, that, that actually leads me to my the question about the... Uh, I, I think that the, this, the idea of a big reevaluation uh, as one of the pathways forward... Uh, I, I said I had several different pathways forward. One of a big reevaluation... Re uh, doesn't strike me as being inconsistent with the argument that somewhere around, which I think is, which is almost certain to happen, somewhere around 27, 20, 20, silly here, somewhere around 2018, 2019, you know, the Russians look over the horizon and they say, oh, hey, what's this? You know, new stars going to expire. Wait a second, we're going to lose a lot of stuff we like. Uh, and, then, and then, and then, but maybe you can do better than just uh, just extending new stars for another five years. And, and as they say in Washington, kicking the can down the road. Because you know, I, I think there are fundamental uh, ch challenges uh, that you, that you need to address and try to address. Uh, so I don't think I don't think uh, it'll I don't think it will all fall apart. Uh, and 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 an interesting question is whether this will make it. I actually think it turned out to be more likely to create a sense amongst all the players <coughs> that that hey, this arms control stuff uh, benefits us and that we have strategic reasons to try to work in this direction. Uh, particularly if the man of three and uh, threat. Um, on the uh, why 2045, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's, 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 it's not so, uh, it's, it's not so far away. I mean, it's, <laughs> so to, to the other criticism, the other criticism is going to be 2045, you've got to be kidding, that's, you know, that's so close. How in the world can we ever get to any of this stuff by 2045? How are we going to convince the French that they don't need nuclear weapons so the Germans can't march down the shelves and we say it? By 2045, come on, it's a long way. Uh, 2045, I chose 2045 because it's, to my mind, it, it is just such an obvious date. It's a hundred years after you use these things for the first time and only time thing. And so, to my mind, that's why. Uh, and I think you need you need a goal. That's what I think part of the the, the, the problem with uh, you know the proud vision. Oh, we're all in favor of a nuclear revolution, but maybe not in my lifetime, and so on. <laughs> Give me, give me some place I want to get to. Now maybe I'll, never, I'll, I'll, perfect, I'll be frank amongst you all. And uh, uh, in other words, you know, maybe we'll never get there. It is possible you will never realize the strategic elimination goal, let alone the evolution goal, by 2045. But you could make a lot of progress taking this as a low star of where you want to go and, and spelling it out in some real ways. Uh, 
Is there a theory behind my, 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 my argument about whether nuclear ma weapons matter or not? Uh, uh, or, or I think part of the theory behind my argument is that um, nuclear, ma nuclear weapons still matter in some ways, so realistically you have to address those ways in which they still matter. Uh, secondly, you have to ch change the change the underlying conditions which lead countries to think that nuclear weapons still matter. Um, but at the same time, I think you have to push back hard on the recidivism, that's a good way to put it, Russian recidivism about the use of ability of nuclear weapons. And, and, and so it's, it's probably a mix, of, a mix of both of those. Uh, what about the countries uh, okay, look, where did you get the 2045 and, and, and there are some countries which still think they need positive security assurances. Um, well, at that point in time, I think you would only have partially realized this vision. You would probably still be in a world, to the extent that we're in a world in 2045, in, in which the South Koreans and the Japanese continue to believe that given the underlying political conflicts within that region, they need a, 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 a nuclear element of the American Security Alliance, uh, then uh, you will have put in place a building block of getting there. And, you, and you, won't, you might be in a world in which you have greater strategic uh, restraint and reassurance between the U.S. and China, uh, but you wouldn't be in a world which you're going to eliminate these weapons strategically. You'd still, you'd still have extended deterrence being necessary. Nuclear weapons would still be necessary in some sense. be seen as necessary. So uh, I don't think, you know, uh, was that, was that, is that six answers for six questions? You know, I can't, you know, well, that's, that's, uno, three, uh, that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. All right, I heard Ma'am, if you could introduce yourself to uh, the Hi, group um, here. Today. My name is Dami. I'm a CNS fellow. I think that's short introduction. I don't want to waste time. Uh, so <laughs> my, I love, I love the fact that it's very simplistic and in terms of policy making, which I'm really in, in, involved and interested in, I think this is something that any government would love to hear or participate in. The only contention will be the stamina of whoever is the next U.S. government and the rhetoric during this process as we're speaking. A. Donald Trump. If he becomes a president, will he be able to understand what you have said? Uh, I'm not. I'm not being insulted. I'm just. I'm just stating the obvious. And then um, um, B would be my favorite, which is Hillary. But she's having so much problems now, and people like us looking like we respect. We respect the the democracy of America. We respect the federalism of America. How is this person going to be able to enforce this policy? You know, because the person has, unfortunately, um, Hillary has so much, I don't want to say blood on her hands, but in terms of um, the democracy is government of the people for the people, by the people, I think that's what it is. So if the people that are electing this person to power or authority are, are contesting it, but they're just saying this is the lesser of of both evil, how is it that we on the outside would even, I'm not even going into China, I'm looking at African countries, would be able to say, take this person really seriously, or oh, if, if I don't do this, you will do that. No, that's not going to happen. So I think that person is going to need a lot of tutoring um, and understanding of this process. The fact that, I love the fact that the, the, the policy is futuristic and is relating to us now. So say 20, 2045, I think that's the goal, is really good. And we're looking at asymmetrical warfare as the conversation we're having now, not nations engaging in one another, with one another. So maybe by then we would be able to go with this policy. But helping that person understand this policy would be the best approach, I think, whoever the person is. Well, let's back and ask them. A question here too. Um, I guess I'm concerned about the time frame uh, more uh, because I'm not persuaded that we have that much time uh, to resolve 
some immediate issues, uh, which while on the agenda seem uh, neither to be of particular concern to the United States or Russia or most of the rest of the world, uh, which uh, is focused on a ban treaty. And I mean, I'm concerned with nuclear risk reduction involving the United States and, and mm -hmm. Russia. The potential for accidents, miscalculations, which could happen tomorrow. I, I, I honestly don't believe uh, that we have uh, another you know, 35 years uh, to try to sort these things out, to kind of uh, stand back and assess what works, what hasn't, how we can move, move forward. And unfortunately, I don't see anybody uh, really focused on this. And you can look at the, the P5 meeting uh, a little over a week ago. Uh, the, the major breakthrough, they're going, the Chinese were successful in getting most parties, although Russia wasn't on board even for this, uh, to do a, another edition of the glossary. I mean, this, uh, if you look at that glossary, uh, uh, I defy you to find something uh, that is kind of novel or particularly relevant uh, to the work that we do. Uh, and the five had difficulty even agreeing on an expanded version of it. Uh, one other thing that they uh, agreed to, again, and the Russians were reluctant to uh, to commit to this, was a meeting, I think, in, in October uh, that will involve some discussion of, of nuclear doctrines, which may be useful. So I don't see the P5 as providing the, the lead that we would, uh, would need. But uh, even less than the P5, I just don't see, I mean, uh, my students will recall this, I try to get Lewis to come to the open-ended work group, I think, and we want to do it. <coughs> but uh, uh, to, to listen to the overwhelming majority of states talk about the issues that we're talking about, uh, they want action immediately. Uh, and that's what they're going to express uh, at the uh, first committee uh, within another month. And they have the votes to make that happen. And it's the one thing that may galvanize the P5 to work together, uh, but they'll be working together to counter uh, the call for a, for a ban treaty. And what's so disappointing uh, is that many of these non-nuclear weapon states who are uh, I think, uh, understandably, exceptionally frustrated by the slow pace of disarmament, they regard all of the practical steps, the building blocks, the so-called progressive uh, approach that was articulated by the nuclear umbrella states uh, at the open-ended working group as a distraction from their priority. They're not interested at all in reviving discussions uh, on a fiscal material cutoff treaty. Uh, they were hard pressed to even endorse the watered down and basically anodyne uh, resolution that passed this morning uh, in the Security Council uh, with respect to uh, a comprehensive test ban treaty, which can be reassuring to the Senate Republicans uh, because it doesn't do anything. Basically. And even then, Egypt abstained was not prepared to, to support it. So, uh, you know, I'm troubled about how we, we find the way to, to have the time to do what you're talking about, because you really didn't focus, I, I think, in, at least in your prepared remarks, Lewis, and I looked at your paper a long time ago, I want to go back and read it, on the risk reduction element, the immediate problems that I think are, should be first and foremost. Uh, if we're going to have the time subsequently, whatever the time frame, to solve the bigger issues. Okay, um, in response. Uh, first, on the, the, lead, the leadership issue, um, I'm not going to get into uh, American politics one way or the other as to who's going to be elected president. Um, but I do, I, I do believe that part of the argument has to be that whoever is elected president is going to try to serve U.S. interests. Mm -hmm. And that uh, U.S. interests, uh, I think, would be better served by moving down uh, these paths. And, and, and that will be the argument that will take place. Uh, on the question, which I think I understood the uh, next to last question, it was, kind of the, it was kind of the opposite in a way of the question that I didn't, uh, didn't answer. 
uh, for the first round of questions. The first, which was whether or not, uh, the second time I took it as a question, well, will others around the world take the United States seriously? Uh, or the first question, the first approach was, will others around the world, meaning basically uh, the US and the, the Chinese and the, and the Russians take us too seriously? And thus, and thus, thus uh, the, 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 the statement that uh, if you don't want to cooperate, we're going to do whatever we think is necessary to uh, protect our security um, could, could, could lead to uh, uh, actions which would be disadvantageous to all three of them, the U.S., the Russians, and the Chinese. And I think that is a risk, and I think that it depends upon how you send the message and how positive you are in terms of your readiness to cooperate. I, I will argue that I do fall into the category of those who believe that um, the unilateral restraint you know, is, is not a way to convince either the Russians or the Chinese that, that uh, uh, it's in their interest to uh, work some of these problems more. Uh, and so, so, and those, so that is the that is the position. It's a judgment issue, and there have been different judgments. And I, I guess I would argue over time, if I think back to the most the most obvious case of this, which had to do with the ability to eventually negotiate the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, eliminating a whole category of, of missiles from Europe, only once the Russians realized that the P-5 and the cruise missiles actually were going to be deployed to Europe, and that the Europeans would allow this to happen, did they suddenly decide, oh, well, we pulled out of these negotiations a year ago, but maybe we ought to come back into them. Yeah. So, so, so in that sense, I guess I take the argument that, that being, being willing to make military investments, even if it's as one of my uh, former, uh, one of my you know, people I've worked with said, he doesn't like the idea of making a step forward to then take you know, steps back. You know, you know, okay. On Bill, on your point about um, uh, risk, I, I, I fully agree. I think part we have we face at this point in time, to my mind, um, uh, one big risk with regard to the use of nuclear weapons, and I do believe this is that this is this is uh, a, a Russian infatuation with the usability of these weapons and the threat of the use of these weapons. And so, part of the challenge for the next American uh, president has got has got to be to find a package of ways to convince to convince the Putin leadership that they just plain got it wrong. And 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 some of that I think is is you can do cooperatively. Um, some of it, I think, you do by uh, not cooperatively. Some of it is taking is, is you do it by avoiding the situations which could be a kind of lightning rod for adventurism by the Russians, which could get you into a confrontation, which means strengthening strengthening internal stability in the Baltics and so on. Um, on the other aspect of risk, though, um, I think some of that risk there is a P5 role in, it, and and in my discussions on and off with various you know P5. They kind of, you know, there's reluctance to go down this path, but it's not, it's not clear to me that this is a path that you couldn't create a consensus to work. Because who's going to be the most affected by a use of nuclear weapons? Uh, it could very well be the P5. Uh, not only, but and so, so I think the P5 have a big interest in trying to work this problem. Um, in addition, it strikes me though that there are other ways to slice into it than just the P5. There's other types of nuclear risk reduction that, that could be pursued. Maybe they have to be pursued more ad hoc. Uh, if, you, if you're looking at the, you know, in, in the case of in the case of South Asia, nuclear risk reduction has been very much the case that uh, when the Indians and the Pakistanis sort of stumble towards the nuclear threshold, the United States government continues to run a whole bunch of senior diplomats through both capitals on the grounds that both countries will be reluctant to use nuclear weapons and kill the American Secretary of State, who's sitting in, in, in the middle of New Delhi. I mean, so there's an American role here. Now, it's been argued, you know, Michael Crapon makes the argument that over time, as we become tougher on Pakistan, the Pakistanis are less willing to listen to us. So maybe there's a Chinese role here. So, 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 so who, so it might just be identifying you know, the, the, the different dimensions of nuclear risk in the world that we're going into uh, and, and trying to work, work them in, in different ways. And the paper discusses some of this, and, and it's not a nuclear risk reduction paper, otherwise it would have been 150 pages. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. That's the big, that's the big challenge today. And, and, but I think some of that is, is related to, you know, convincing Putin that 
And Reagan Gorbachev were right. Um, okay, on the question of the non-nuclear weapon states, uh, if, if I were frank, I'm going to say a franker. I mean, even though I'm being taped. Uh, <laughs> Two cameras. Uh. <laughs> uh, I'm waiting to see, uh, and I'm going to send this paper out next in the week when it hits the streets, to a whole bunch of, of the non-nuclear weapon state ambassadors that I've been talking to over the course of, of two or three years. And I am waiting to see what uh, the reaction is. Uh, I think it, I think first that, as I argue, that setting out a long-term vision with some real meat to it, uh, and with it, with it, with an end, and an end, even if it's, even if it's too far away from, from Paul Warnke III, uh, it's still, it's not so close. One of my friends, God forbid, that I recently, uh, can I tell this joke? One of my friends uh, said to me, we were complaining about, 20, he was, I was complaining about somebody else suggesting something else for 2045. That they were going to suggest by 2045 the United States and Russia would commit to come down to 4,000 nuclear wars. And I said, my God, 4,000 nuclear wars. You're going to try to get any credit within the NPT for that? And this really good friend of mine says to me, hey, Lou, don't worry. By 2045, you'll be dead. <laughs> so 2045 is not exactly, you know, hopefully it will not be the case. Maybe I can be like, you know, knock on wood, like George Schultz. You know, I keep chugging along. But, but, you know, so 2045 isn't, is so, but to my mind, uh, part of the need to, it is essential to re-engage the non-nuclear weapon states. It is essential to make the argument within the new administration on re-engaging the non-nuclear weapon states. I noticed in this, in this resolution, uh, excuse me for a piece of immodesty, in this resolution of the UN Security Council, it talks about the NPT is the cornerstone of the global non-proliferation regime. I wrote those words 30 years ago. And the thing is, is that although they're a great talking point, they actually are true. They actually are true. Without the NPT, you get into a lot of trouble. So hopefully you can convince the nuclear weapon states that, hey, wait a second, you know, we got the non-nuclear weapon states, we need to move in this direction. Now, with the non-nuclear weapon states, I think it's partially giving them a vision which is better than step by step. Partially, but I, but I acknowledge, in, in the talk I acknowledge, unless you actually get some results. And part of it, part of it, let's to be frank, it's, it remains to be seen where the, where the first committee will go, uh, on the idea of a, of a, of a ban of a ban resolution, uh, and, to, and to my mind, it's uh, it's worse than useless to to, to create a uh, negotiation for a nuclear weapons ban uh, without the nuclear weapon states. Uh, I, I I fully believe, from having worked in this business uh, for the better part of 40 years. Uh, that the result is not going to be to delegitimize nuclear weapons. The result is going to be to delegitimize nuclear disarmament. What is going to happen is that the five nuclear weapon states uh, are basically going to say, okay, that's your game. You guys go do this nuclear weapons ban. Um, forget. You want to wait? We had a chemical weapons ban, what, 1925? And, and, and we had a chemical weapons convention in... in, in 1990 what? 1997. Okay. What? 87. No, no, no. The Chemical Weapons Convention gets negotiated in the 90 in the 90s because let it go. I bet it's 97 or something. It's it's it's, it's later uh, because they traded the away they traded Paris. away they traded away the arms control and disarmament agency for the Chemical Weapons Convention ratification and a future draft choice. And so, um, so, 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 okay, so the nuclear weapons states are going to say, fine, okay, you guys have a nuclear weapons ban, so come back to us in 30, 30, 35, 45, 55, 65, 75, 85, 95, come back to us in another 70 years and we'll talk about a nuclear, you know, we'll talk about this. I honestly believe this. And so part of the argument that I would make, Bill, to the non-nuclear weapon states, and to, to those non-nuclear weapon states who, who, who are of the, of the view that uh, they need to have, there's no, there's no great, this is what I like on tape, there is no great leap forward in nuclear disarmament that's out there. You can't have 
if, if, if Miles Greatly Forward had a bunch of blast furnaces in everybody's backyard, you can't have a bunch of nuclear weapons disassembly furnaces in everybody's backyard. There's no Great Leap Forward in this business. And I think, I think that the, the, five, the five can make that argument more convincingly if they have another argument which, is, which shows that they're actually trying to get someplace. On, on the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, I agree with you completely, but it's a cutoff treaty. The question which is, is, is whether if it actually gets broader and it really does become something that puts in place one of the fundamental aspects of moving forward on nuclear disarmament, uh, in terms of all that transparency, does that, does that sell more and more? Because it's hard to figure out how you go forward towards a world without nuclear weapons in which we have no idea what the Russians have produced, what the Chinese have produced, what the, what the French have produced, and so on. You've got to get a handle on the material in the past existing stocks. The, the, these guys are right. It's not disarmament to just do a cover. But what if you actually made it sort of semi disarmament with, 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 and so on? <coughs> you, you got me going, I'm sorry. This is fun. I appreciate it. So I saw Ruby Lee have to wrap up and. That's okay. It's, it's you know. okay. okay. Well, this is a, a discussion. Bill has my email, by the way. So if anybody right. wants, has any other comments, we'll we've got right another there. 35 yeah. years to carry out the discussion here to prove whether or not. <laughs> it's only 19. <laughs> so uh, please join me in thanking Louis for. Uh, <laughs>